Hi there, everybody. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, it's good to uh, sort of meet you here um, in this uh, unique conversation uh, happening across the country with Canadian Geographic. I'm grateful for them, grateful to them for organizing such a, a unique platform uh, right before the school year gets started. So. Uh, when teachers are generally um, at a point where they can actually take in some new ideas because as soon as September hits then it's like pedal to the metal for the next 10 months and it's hard to incorporate a lot of new things. Um, I know this from the last 15 years of, of high school teaching and and um, yeah uh, I'll, I'll say hello. My name's Adam Robb and I'm obviously I've got a I know the lighting might not be the best, but I thought I would sacrifice perfect lighting uh, for the fact that I have beautiful mountains behind me right now. I'm in um, uh, Canmore, Alberta, and um, just really excited to be part of this national uh, discussion about new ideas and about creating change makers. Um, it aligns very well with everything that I've tried to direct my career towards. So um, so when I throw on my uh, presentation here, um, I think that I won't be able to see chat questions. So I think what I intend to do is um, to give you an overview of, of my presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and the motivation for the new project that uh, myself and some some other wonderful people uh, have begun and um, and then I hope to come back full screen and be able to take uh, questions about specifics here. Um, at the end of the presentation, I definitely have um, exciting news and an offer for um, both yourselves and, and maybe some of the young people in your lives that um, that you're in contact with. And so I hope I can keep you engaged uh, for the next 20 to 30 minutes about, about what I'm up to. And then um, you'll be able to um, hear about this opportunity um, coming at you. So I will uh, go ahead and share screen now. Okay, I'm trusting that you can hear me and I'm sure the moderator will jump in if uh, you can't hear or see my screen. But um, I titled this session, Filling in the Gaps of Our Education System. And it's directed towards uh, the new program that I have started um, or that I've helped to start. I can't take all the credit called the Howell Experience or just Howell. Um, and, uh, but yes we should start from the start and look at reconciliation and, and one of those pieces of reconciliation is doing land acknowledgements but that's just a piece of course um but you should know where i'm coming from today uh we acknowledge we are working and playing on the traditional territories of the blackfoot confederacy the siksika the gainai and the pikani the sutina the Arhe nakota nations the metis nation region three and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Um, but I love this question, what actions are you taking towards truth and reconciliation? Uh, for me, uh, the more I've become educated about the need for true reconciliation and the need for truth um, in, in regards to this topic, the more I've directed my career to pursuing um, reconciliation education. And I think you'll see that a lot of the work um, that I've started to do in this uh, career path, career shift, is directed towards creating real opportunities for youth to engage in reconciliation. Reconciliation requires two groups of people working together uh, towards an end point uh, that, they, that they see as being valuable for both sides. And so um, the road to reconciliation is just starting. And I, I hope you'll take some time to reflect about your own actions and, and things that you're doing in your own classroom or your own lives um, 
to get to that point. Um, okay, I like to start with this question, a point of self-reflection as, as well, um, which is usually comes up with some pretty funny results. Um, what did you think your career would be when you were in high school? Um, I raised this question because uh, thinking back, it's it's quite comical. Some of the things that went through my mind and how impressionable I was if somebody had a unique idea um, or I met somebody with a unique career, you know, I went through a lot of things. I you, There was the time that I was going to be a farmer or a paleontologist and, and many other things. Um, and I know many people on this call have some funny stories and some of the lucky ones, you know, you knew what you wanted to be right away and you pursued that pathway. But even then, um, what I'm trying to get you to do is reflect where that idea came from. And um, for many people, it was nothing more than a whim or a exciting experience that happened or, or meeting somebody in a space where you said, yeah, I could see myself doing something like that. Um, and the reason for this question in regards to what we're talking about is I think that uh, youth are, are really missing a big piece of this discovery of looking at what they could potentially become um, in their lives. It's due to a lack of exposure and a lack of experience. And I think as educators, our job is to give them as many experiences as possible where they can be exposed to people and landscapes and inspiration that can lead them in in career and education paths that lead to um, lead to better careers better <laughs> feeling fulfilled all of those good things um, the second intention is looking at what do you wish you could change about the traditional education system uh, it's not perfect and some of you on here are um, in your in your own way change makers trying to influence the way that education is done across the country. And I'm grateful to be here with you and share that same set of values. Um, I've gone through all sorts of different, um, I guess, iterations of, of myself trying to change the system. Everything from modeling how my own classroom functioned in high school to uh, in a high school to actually trying to change the way that schools are built across the province of Alberta and basically beating my head against the wall um, of trying to change the direction of a massive bureaucratic ship and, and uh, got down a lot about things like that, about the lack of change in education. But my, um, my good feelings came when I let students lead the way with, with the attempts to change and let them uh, talk to the powers that be about, about how they felt about education and, and what actually was working for them the best. So I would love to talk with all of you one on one and hear about what what aspect of education you wish you could change, um, whether it's the, the curriculum, whether it's the timetable, whether it's the months of the year that we go to school, whether it's the class sizes, there's just so many little things that when we start to deconstruct this question, um, we get down to what actually um, does good learning look like? Is it just the education system or are we really honoring how honor, how learning should look uh, for students? Uh, the theme of this conference is global citizenship inspiring the next generation of change makers. My question is where will this inspiration come from? Um, will it come from schools? Well, some people it comes from schools, but my part of an argument here, it's not really an argument is that lots of this inspiration will come outside of school and um, meaning that when people connect more with their community when they have great experiences that's where the change maker uh, aspect comes from uh, so like i mentioned i'm a recovering high school teacher of 15 years um, i had the absolute honor and good fortune of being able to create an environmental education program here in Alberta, uh, actually several programs. And most recently in Calgary, where I ran an environmental education program for youth from across the city who wanted to specialize in these topics. Well, tip, it was supposed to be for students who wanted to specialize. I just ended up with all students, some who came there by accident and, and never left. So 
Um, so we created a, a program where they could jump into community-based projects, learn on the land. Um, all of the learning had to be real world outcomes. It all had to be based on experiences. And um, I feel like we had a lot of success. We traveled places, we started our own businesses. Um, we built community gardens, we got chickens and bees and uh, had students speak at conferences all over the place. Um, really, honestly, I had the best job in the Calgary School Board, which is the second largest school board in, in the country. So you could maybe even say I had one of the best uh, education jobs in Canada. Um, being able to create um, uh, these and work with all different types of students to see what they were interested in, introduce them to uh, environmental topics and community-based uh, design topics, architecture, all these things, all these problem-solving aspects of life uh, to help make the world a better place and then let them play a little bit, give them the space and time to to create and support them in, in doing so. Um, so a really, really wonderful uh, job that I was able to have and supporting lots of other teachers as well. I know that's not the case with everybody. Most most of my colleagues, most of um, you are, uh, you know, there's a lot of classroom teachers where it's just like a really specific curriculum that you gotta get across. There's very few resources and so on and so on. Uh, there's so many different parameters that you have to work with. And um, I did start in that type of setting and sort of like elbowed my way to being able to have um, a huge lab space and, um, we sought out a lot of our own funding with students writing their own grants and and we were able to do everything that we wanted to do. Um, that's not to like toot my horn or anything. It's just to say I was very fortunate to be in that position, um, but I am no longer there. I stepped away from that position. Um, the results of that program where we allowed students to design their own learning and create or solve their own community problems that they identified was incredible. They uh, termed it the first of seven generations education and um, we had so many good things happen. Students ran their own conferences and um, created their own community groups and uh, speaking of changing the way schools were built, um, one of our students was responsible for uh, the government agreeing to put solar panels on all new schools being built in the province and some of the existing schools. Um, Students who did their own TED Talks led uh, student-led movements during the pandemic to get uh, grow materials into the hands of all the of all students at home across the province so that they could grow their own gardens. Uh, opened our own thrift store. I could go on and on, but um, it was really incredible what we were able to achieve just by giving students the time and space to think about their own uh, think about the community problems that were affecting them. Um, and yes, we got lots of recognition, uh, including in Canadian Geographic and um, uh, across North America and in the OECD countries for education. It was, again, a really simple formula that led to a lot of success. Um, and so the outcomes of the results from this type of education were really, really positive. And I'm leading you down a path here, so I hope you'll stay with me. Um, Many of those students who came into that program went on to become excellent community members. They didn't necessarily all go into environmental science, some went into journalism or tech or architecture, like I mentioned, um, entrepreneurs, urban planners, all sorts of things, but they all were rooted in this common understanding of, of how to work with community, how to solve problems. And I would say that the students coming out of this program uh, were problem solvers and they were and they've become community leaders um, and how do i know this well i stay in touch with a lot of them we've never had our program actually studied uh, we actually um, the big thing that we wanted to measure was you know how does this affect their uh, learning performance overall in alberta we we focus mostly on standardized tests here and uh, so we started doing uh, grade 12 courses where there was a standardized test at the end within this lab setting, um, this type of education environment. 
And turns out by not looking at the textbook and focusing on um, unique problems in the community that were yet to be solved, they did just as well or better um, all across the board from, uh, plus their attendance was, was better as well. So we had a lot of success in that realm. The frustrating part for me was watching students of all types succeed. And by all types, I mean, really, like we had students who had 99% averages and we had students who had been kicked out of three high schools and we would throw them all into the same class and they would do really well. Um, but it was frustrating how uh, little of this really simple education model was being uh, replicated into other schools or school districts or whatever it is, um, because I think we found something that was really successful and um, it was hard watching students who weren't in our program um, uh, not gain these skills and not gain the opportunities and experiences um, that were leading to these good outcomes. So all of that led me to start looking at what comes next after high school. Um, where were the students in our program going after? Where were their friends going who were not in our program? I just kept thinking about this topic. Um, so did the success or confidence that my students were experiencing carry over into their day-to-day -day lives? And I don't even know, I'm not an academic, I don't know how to prove something like that, that uh, this type of education would have a positive influence on, on their career or education pathways. Um, but I did think a lot about um, in Canada, what happens after high school um, is really interesting and it is different than in other countries um, we really, really have this push uh, to get from kindergarten to grade 12 uh, to get people ready for the end of high school and for get ready for post-secondary right away. Um, but we don't necessarily give youth or students the ability to um, figure out for themselves what pathway they should be going down. Um, so we might have lots of the learning background. Uh, it's mostly conceptual. We're not uh, giving them the experience in life, the hands-on experience to actually feel what it's like to do this or to accomplish something or to um, work with a group of people in the community different than themselves. Um, these are the components that I see that are missing. Um, so some, some numbers to lead you down this pathway of thinking that I went through um, when I started reading a lot about this topic, about what, what are students doing after high school in Canada. And I found out, much to my surprise, that it's around 40% is the uh, post-secondary graduation rate. Um, specifically, I think more so for university. But I had no idea that the graduation rate was so low. Um, the second number there is 60%. 60% is the number of first-year students who either drop out or switch programs. And I think that's a massive number because of uh, the, the amount of money involved in going to university for a first year. And in talking to many grade 12s um, from my program and, and from elsewhere, you know, it can be very clear that, you know, my, my parents are making me go to university or whatever or to do a program, uh, even though I have no idea what I want to do. And they just want me to find myself while I'm there or I'm taking a general studies program or I really want to go into biology because my highest mark was in biology and and so therefore I will love being a biologist and you know there's there's this lack of knowing and understanding about what comes next and um, and I think that's all due to a lack of experience from um, from the life of a of a typical student. So this 60% to 8%, let me explain that just really quickly. When I started looking around at other countries and um, how they handled uh, the exit plan from high school to university or to any post-secondary, I found that there was a real range in, um, in countries and how they pushed people to go into post-secondary. And so what I mean by that is in Canada, like I said, I feel like there's a really strong push for people when they're 17, 18 to go directly into post-secondary. Um, in Denmark, as an example, uh, they really push people not to go into post-secondary right away. Uh, the push is to go gain life experience, to go learn a language, to go work on a farm, to go 
just do anything where you can find out more about yourself uh, in that direction. And so they call these like structured gap years and there's all sorts of wonderful programs. And I mean, there are so far <laughs> on the end of the spectrum on the, in this realm that they actually pay people to go and gain life experience. Uh, they'll pay for your expenses. They'll even give you a living wage to go and do these things. I'm sure you've met lots of uh, Australians or uh, Kiwis working in the tourism industry in Canada, and those are all young folks on their gap year. Uh, in New Zealand, for example, you get a full tax credit for what you spend on your gap year program. Um, so yeah, lots of different ways of looking at it in Canada. It's not there yet. A gap year doesn't really mean something very structured. It might mean something structured to a few people, but for most people, it means like, I'm just taking a year off to work at Superstore or whatever it is. So the 8% number there is in Denmark. That's their uh, percentage of first year students who drop out or switch programs. Uh, and so in Canada, it's 60% and in Denmark, it's 8%. And I hugely attribute that to the um, push to gain experiences. So when you do the economics of that and paying for people to go gain life experience, it actually uh, starts to make a lot more sense how they afford to pay people to go do that. Because if we're government is paying half our tuition to go and do first year university, that doesn't necessarily lead to a degree. We're wasting a lot of money on sending youth to post-secondary in things that they don't want to be in. Uh, the $40,000 thing, that's the average debt after four years of post-secondary. Um, and that's really hard to get out of, let alone even think about being a consumer in the housing market these days. Um, so all of that, that's all motivation for starting my own structured gap year program after high school to fill in the gaps of the education system specifically experience and community. And so I wanted to create um, uh, a program that would provide for young people after they graduate to all the way up to what Canada defines as a youth is up to 30 years old, uh, a place to go where uh, the learning is structured, um, but they still have the opportunity for independent, um, uh, I guess, pursuits like uh, getting to volunteer uh, with organizations that we link them to or um, getting out on the land in their own way. Um, so we created Howl and Howl is a, a nonprofit education, experiential education program for after high school. Um, and I've just started this last September. Um, I put in for a leave from high school teaching and set out down this course and it's been quite a ride. In one year, we've um, we established as a nonprofit, and we've run uh, five short sessions with youth from across the country, from every single province, from the ages of 17 to 31. And uh, the overwhelming conclusion after meeting with youth in these age groups was that they were so grateful um, for the opportunity, and they needed it so badly. Um, especially after the pandemic, I guess, which has just heightened that issue that uh, we're already facing in the education system, which is trying to get students to have experiences. Um, so this is just uh, kind of an overview from our website, why I choose a Howell experience. Um, it's about community and connection and, and where else can you actually gain access to Indigenous knowledge keepers on your learning path? Um, where can you go learn without the pressure of, of tests? Uh, where can you get inspired to, to pursue something? Where can you meet entrepreneurs, biologists, all these people you never got to meet when you were actually um, supposed to be learning in, in high school or, or earlier? Um, here's an introduction. We provide the introductions to all these people. We get you out in the field. Um, we get you um, sitting down and hearing how people in the community try and solve the problems impacting their communities. So um, in order to do this, I knew that it couldn't just be out of my brain. And so we assembled a cast of youth leaders uh, to help design the program, youth creating programs for other youth. And uh, in, in this, you can see that um, 
well, actually you can't see, but <laughs> the uh, majority of these people are past students that went through um, my program. Um, so Teresa, Lysandra, Shauna, um, all went through a few years with me and they still want to uh, talk to me. So maybe that's a good sign. Uh, and then there's other youth educator leaders here, including um, Daryl Kootenay, who is a, um, a big deal around here. He's from Stony Nakoda Nation and he created the Nakoda Youth Council out here um, to help have youth work on some of the issues um, facing their nation. And he's since become more of a national voice for Indigenous youth and just an incredible person and has jumped on to help create our programs. Uh, really unique people all across the board. Teresa herself is a glaciologist, ethnobotanist, and Indigenous uh, storyteller, beater, and singer. Um, Lysandra is an uh, Indigenous youth journalist who's worked for Global News and Vice and, and so on. Anyways, I could go on and on, but um, they've all seen a real need to provide this type of opportunity for other youth and have jumped on board um, with me. Um, so here's sort of a small overview. We run short and long programs. Um, uh, we have a semester program. So we have one starting in uh, January and another one in September. And so this is where it's like, maybe you know a young person who is looking for what's next in life and, and can't quite get it figured out. Um, we've actually received quite a bit of funding to run these programs and, and to provide financial support for youth to come to Canmore, to this area where I'm sitting right now. It's been four months and get to know this community, get to know this landscape, get to know the efforts specific to here in regards to working with national parks like Banff and Jasper um, to uh, reconcile for the, the unique history um, on this land and, and be part of the reconciliation efforts. And so they come and they gain all of this experience. They learn practical, um, practical self-sustainability skills, as, as I would call it. So things like learning to grow, harvest, and cook uh, food and share food with their community. Um, they learn financial management skills with real money. Uh, and by the end of four months, they're walking away with um, all of this exposure and understanding of a specific community, which is ours in the Bow Valley community here. But in knowing this community really well, they'll better understand their own community through comparisons and perspective. And um, also, we're, um, we've got Rural Roads University signed on to provide some credentials um, as part of this program. Um, and But it's not a one-size-fits-all program. We all explore together, but then it becomes an individualized program where each uh, youth who, who are in the program, we set up with their own schedule, uh, whether it's a work and volunteer schedule, and there's certain things that we all do together. But um, part of it is learning to um, learning to manage all of life and with a little bit of extra help and a little bit of community around you so that they can actually feel what community feels like. So yes, we are running these programs um, kind of aligned with the post-secondary um, calendar. Um, just a quick aside is a little bit of a plug here is there is a program coming up out here in the Rockies uh, September 21st to 27th. This is a short program because an event was coming up that we really wanted to take part in called TPs and Telescopes. And this is an event um, being held. It's, it's held different place in the country every year. And, and this year it's being held out here near Canmore in Kananaskis country. And it's a space uh, exploration program where they bring in elders from across the country who tell stories about stars. And they also bring in indigenous uh, scientists from NASA and MIT uh, to talk and to combine um, traditional knowledge with, with this scientific understanding of, of the stars and so our youth who will bring into this program um, for a week will get to play an integral part of of that um, conference uh, being held outside here um, but they'll also get to do a bunch of other things to connect them with the land including working with Stony Nakoda um, 
learning about the history and issues surrounding Banff National Park, uh, go on some lovely hikes, see some lovely lakes, and all of that good stuff that comes here. So um, we're running that program. If you know any youth who might be interested, they just have to be over 17 um, for an entire week of accommodation, food, and all that stuff. It's as low as $250. And so um, I just jumped into advertising here. I didn't mean to do that. But what I'm really excited about is this type of education program where we can just provide this experience. And I don't think I'm going too far in saying that it would be transformational for many of the youth who took, who were to take part in such an experience. Um, and it would give them lots of perspective about their own lives, but also about um, the issues that specific communities are dealing with. And then they might be paying more attention to those issues when they return home. So we are bringing in youth from across the country to attend this and we've just sort of launched this. So if you know a young person who would want to come out to the Rockies for a week in September over a weekend, um, then please get in touch. Um, so we do, yeah, we do these 10 day learning adventures also up to the Yukon. So we have a deal with uh, the Kluwani Lake Research Station, which is owned by the University of Calgary. And I've just come back from one of these programs where um, we brought youth from across Canada up to the Yukon to experience the North. And for all of them, it was their first ever, I guess, even time they ever even thought of going North. And how else will you get introduced to what the North is all about? Um, it, it's really difficult to do so by yourself. It takes time, it takes lots of connections. And so basically what we can do is give you that introduction, give them that introduction and take them to these beautiful spots. Um, really successful program. The youth obviously just loved being up there. Uh, we're blown away by the scale. If some of you haven't been up there before, I encourage you. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, so some of the things we've done on these short programs, as an example, working with uh, Parks Canada, um, Cave and Basin National Historic Site is where Parks Canada kind of became a thing um, in, in Banff National Park, which is Canada's first national park. But uh, part of the program that we got to do with Daryl was the first ever all Indigenous led tour of this very significant site. And it was, um, the Cave and Basin is like a tourism spot and it used to be like a public pool and kind of a ritzy little place. Um, and, but prior to that, obviously the history is that um, Stony Nakoda in these natural hot springs, this was a, a sacred site. And so we're looking at how we can uh, reconcile what it is now as a tourist attraction with uh, what it had always been and move forward from from that part and so um, just having that different perspective of a of a tourism symbol in in Canada was a really unique experience for youth to be part of and and it really impacted them uh, on the spot there so other things that we've done here's um, Teresa leading in a glacier experience a light hike up to the Athabasca glacier where uh, she talks about uh, the science of climate change and and glaciers but also um, the traditional stories from these areas in alberta what is now alberta and bc about uh, that elders tell about the glaciers and about um, retreatment or advancement um, and also that um, that double perspective of fire that double perspective of pine beetles and all these things that um, are coming to light in in our frame of mind when we see forest fires, when we see forests devastated by pine beetles, when we see climate change having more impacts. Um, there's a lot of traditional knowledge and storytelling that relates to a lot of these topics that we can learn about it and use as um, part of our co-management solutions in the future. And so um, really interesting style of learning that uh, youth were not gaining in their traditional uh, school pathway system. So um, so here's an overview of a program we ran in in June where the focus was on uh, volunteering with different projects. Um, and yeah, so about 22 youth in that program. Half of them were 
BIPOC individuals, um, worked on seven different projects, contributed 1,500 hours of community service. Um, and the joke there is that we served 1,200 burgers at the Stony Dakota Pow Wow, which is true. Um, it was an incredible experience for them to get to see a powwow and contribute to the success by helping run the, the food stand, helping um, to set up and to take down and being accepted into that community. And they, they were just blown away uh, by that experience um, that uh, the folks in Stony Dakota opened up for them. Um, so yeah, we, we talk about learning for community. Um, most youth don't understand community. They don't identify with community at this point. They don't know what it means to be a good community member because they've never been part of that. And I'm saying most youth, I'm not saying like our cream of the crop youth who are winning all of these awards and getting scholarships and such. It's, it's the typical youth do not um, connect with their own community. And so showing them how that looks and feels is a super important component to creating better communities in the future and solving major issues like um, climate change and, and reconciliation. So, um, and taking a deep dive into, into the land as well. Understanding one place really well um, is our focus when we run these programs. Um, we also, this is something specific for um, uh, school-aged youth is that we have started a program back when I was a high school teacher called Canadian Rockies Youth Network and it's bringing youth together across the country to discuss how the Canadian Rockies are going to be managed into the future including national and provincial parks and what are the major issues there and so we host a summit uh, each year and we have uh, a summit coming up this year that is open to any high school student, and so that is something that if you're in contact with with young folks that they could be get involved with. Uh, I forgot to mention with our Yukon programs, we're also going to be managing high school groups going up there. Um, so if there's a high school group, say from Toronto that wants to uh, go up to the Yukon, we have a program set and we have um, all of the contacts ready to go. It's just you you go through us and we manage the education side of things and set up the set up the accommodation and, and all of that stuff. So um, it's a pretty exciting opportunity uh, to expose youth to the north and to the science and traditional knowledge of the north. Um, so excitingly, I can announce that for our semester, for our short programs, we do have full scholarships available. We have partial and full scholarships available. Uh, to, to uh, young folks that you might know in your life who could use something like this and um, who is a typical person that goes into Howell. Uh, honestly, there's no typical, I thought there might be, I thought it might be that high school grad that is kind of uh, looking for their next thing. But honestly, we've had 17 year old, 18 year olds, like I mentioned, but we've also had um, 24 year old single parents who are um, looking for that next step in their life. Um, we've had people who've completed their masters but have no idea what to do with their education still um, because they haven't thought much about that. They've just stayed in the traditional education pathway. Um, we've had low income, we've had privileged uh, backgrounds and everything in between. And um, to a person having this exposure experience with a group of people from all different parts of the country uh, has been a really positive experience. Um, I know that um, Elward Bound is also presenting at this conference and they do an incredible job with outdoor adventure programs and, and uh, really inspiring what they do to take youth outside on these expeditions. I would say ours is a little bit different than that in, in that um, there's a lot more, I guess, uh, components of it's not so much about the actual outdoor adventure journey there's components of that but it's also about um, the community it's about food it's about um, environment specific environmental issues and and all the change makers that make up a community from the entrepreneurs to the scientists um, to the just good general people that that you tend to meet when you're trying to trying to improve things in a community okay um,
So, um, <laughs> I, uh, that's all I wanted to say. And um, I'm just going to look at this question for a second. I think most educators would agree with you wholeheartedly. How do you think we could change the parental push mindset for immediate post-secondary? Ooh, that is the like golden question. And so it's a perfect segue um, in that I really thought that I could change the system from the inside, um, watching students struggle and not, you know, sort of find their place in, in school, um, especially in the high school years and the toll that that was taking and the pressures that they were feeling. Um, and I think that my role in life is to help create that um, change from the outside of the school system. So I hope this doesn't sound too grandiose, but we're, <laughs> we're really hoping to become that sort of lighthouse where we can demonstrate the type of learning, what learning actually looks like without grades, without the pressure of a diploma or anything like that. Um, and maybe by demonstrating that, look, uh, these youth are actually learning despite all of this uh, in these circumstances, maybe we can provide that um, direction of where school systems need to go uh, to demonstrate that not everything depends on having a test at the end of the day that people can still learn in, in, in relation to that. So um, yeah, that's the mindset though is, is tricky because even teachers, right? Um, teachers use it, use this idea of if you don't, um, if you don't do well now, then you're never going to do well. And we just know, having life experience, that that's not true. That many people's life pathways um, are not linear, and they become really interesting through life experiences, through travel. They have to find what they care about in order to really apply themselves. I'm preaching to the choir. I understand this, but. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really tough battle from the inside, for sure. Um, um, okay, yeah, and I agree, society has to learn to value more than the university degree. One would think the pandemic would have opened some eyes to the importance of all types of contributions to society. Well said, yes. Um, and I mean, you know, post-secondary, the university degrees, skills, colleges, all of that stuff. In, in my mind, it's, you know, we're not trying to direct people into becoming environmental scientists or anything like that. Um, I don't I don't have an objective of, of trying to create this type of person. It's trying to get people to figure out what really is their own purpose. And when people are doing that, they're better community members. And when they're, we have more community members who found their true purpose, then we're having better communities and so on and so on. That's, that's, that's the general way that we look at it. Um, we've had really good response from youth who've returned home and have immediately uh, changed pathways or established food security programs at home, uh, just um, taken up action immediately and that's something we're going to be studying over the next year for sure so um yeah educating parents <laughs> that's a extreme battle but again hopefully we can like it's going going to be slow but it's like demonstrating maybe hearing that in other countries um the success of of youth who who go and do things first, who gain that perspective first, and then apply themselves to a program that they're passionate about instead of just finding themselves by um, going into res and having a, a good time, um, you know, is might be more effective. So, um, okay, let's see. Um, this is just highlighting some of the struggles kids have finding their way because our system is archaic. Yeah, I think that's sort of what my thesis is, is, is uh, we spend so much time pushing and time and effort pushing kids through this system. And I would say elementary teachers have done a better job uh, taking up um, this understanding that not all learning happens in, in the four walls of a classroom. And in high school, there's all of a sudden this pressure of like, okay, and a threat, you better learn this now or else you're going to fail 
after high school. If you fail after high school, you fail through life and all these things. It's, I've heard, I've heard everything. I've heard day one of high school teachers saying, okay, now, uh, now it starts now, like now you're in for it. And, um, it's, it's used as a threat more than anything. And it's, it's to cover up the fact that we're not providing these things in school. We're not providing true authentic experiences for you to really find themselves and find their passion. Um, yes, so I agree. And Nicole, do you think this would be beneficial for the younger elementary ages? And if so, do you have intentions to expand into that age group? So um, I think Nicole, like any experiential education is great and, and I'm sure you're already doing some of that. And then I would, my advice is to not be afraid to get to wade into the chaos, to be messy a little bit in terms of um, what you're going to do with them. It's it's it can be as simple as getting to know and be stewards of of a local park or school ground. Um, sorry, I, I don't think you can see me because of this light, but um, <laughs> um, we do want to provide education to younger folks, but we want our youth that are coming through our programs to lead that direction. And so um, what I do foresee is that a potential, something like um, a forest school being run by youth as an off youth in our program as an offshoot to our, to our own program to carry on that knowledge. But it has to be youth who are um, pushing for that and, and wanting to see that happen. Um, there's lots of good, you know, forest schools and, and things like this that we're seeing that people are um, jumping into more and more, but uh, again, it's that like, once you get out of elementary school, then that type of learning is not seen as, as important anymore. And I, I think that's totally backwards. Um, I think kids need to be high school kids. Any kid needs to be out on a farm regularly. I think they need to be in the woods. I think they need to be working with their hands and it's all just going to help all of their other academic type things. So, um, I love the idea value of what you're talking about regarding gap year. Our students are only 17 upon graduation. They need time to step back and experience other pieces of life. Yes. Yeah. Ask a 17 year old what they want to be. That's a very funny conversation. Um, going back to what I was originally talking about. Um, because typically when you ask a grade 12, they're going to say like nurse, doctor, fireman, um, you know, these really generic professions that they knew about when they were in grade two. You could ask a grade two class the same question and they would have the same answer. Um, they don't know what they don't know. Um, they're heading for the only directions that they actually know. And that's not the direction for everybody. That's for sure. And so um, by taking time out to learn about other people's pathways, learn about who's contributing in a community, um, our hope is that by meeting all these people, they'll say like, yep, that's the person, that very ecologist guy that goes and checks the traps. Um, that's, that's where I want to go. Or the entrepreneur that's using his ski business to support um, local efforts to um, help, help impoverish children uh, get school lunches, you know, like it, it can come from anywhere. And, uh, but they don't know about these stories. They don't meet these people or um, get involved with them uh, in any way. So um, create a program for teachers to take to. Yeah, we are going to do that. So that will likely be happening this fall. Um, we did it, a small program where we took teachers up to uh, the Yukon at the end of May this past uh, spring. And so we took 14 teachers up there, uh, educators and teachers, and it was unbelievable. So um stay tuned for that we're going to if um yeah i'm happy to stay in touch and and, and uh talk with you about uh these possibilities um because i i do think professional development opportunities would be a hit as well both here in the rockies out in the banff area as well as up in the yukon um and do you have your students or former students speak in schools about their experiences with your program a little bit, but maybe that's something um, that we could do more. Um, 
Yeah, that's it's really interesting. I think when they were with me in school, um, we always got them speaking to the school boards. We got them speaking to, um, you know, other um, organizations, big conferences and things like that. And they would always be such a hit. But the reality is you just didn't see much outcome from that. Um, it was like we had this really cool uh, lab space that we worked in with, you know, living walls and fish tanks and all sorts of construction stuff going on. And, and this is like a social studies class. Like it's, there's so many things happening. People would come and take pictures and we got featured in a magazine on and on and on. But the reality is, it's just, it's, it's really hard to change um, the way things are because of the demands of parents, uh, what teachers are used to doing, what, how schools are set up, efficiency, all of those things that we all know about and are trying to overcome. Um, but at the end of the day, what it is about is what's best for students and um, providing that individual outlet and spark is really what it's all about. So, um, yeah, so through professional development opportunities, through um, getting our the youth who go through our program are going to be our best spokespeople to be able to tell these stories. Not me, as you can tell, I'm not the best public speaker, but it's... Um, uh, it's just building that slowly and, and hopefully we have groups of people across the country being able to speak to the value of these types of things and then what they come up with. I'm really excited to see um, the next iterations of what Howl becomes. Uh, I, I honestly just can't even imagine. So um, in case you haven't already done so, um, check out our website and this is a real invitation if you ever would want to come out and um take part in one of our youth sessions by by being there with us by you know volunteering as a form of professional development um that is an open offer um but also please if you know a young person a neighbor a former student uh, anybody who's um just looking for something more in life and figuring out what's next then please send send them our way um and there's, yeah, this September program, this TPs and telescopes program is coming right up. And uh, it's honestly, like, I can't even, I couldn't create a more wonderful program <laughs> if I tried. It just happens to be happening in our backyard and we have full access to it. Um, you know, I'm imagining sitting under a mountain in Kananaskis with Wil the elder Wilford Buck from Manitoba telling stories about um, the different star patterns and how it links into the lessons in, in, um, in the Cree storytelling uh, narratives. And then uh, just, just being there for that and going for a beautiful hike the next day, um, looking through telescopes with indigenous NASA scientists and, and so on is just like, these are the types of opportunities I just want to help create more and more of um, because I think so many young people would benefit from these things. So, um, okay, I'm going to stop talking and thanks for, for joining. Um, I'll put my email on here as well. And I really hope like maybe even now you'll just send me a, a quick email to say hello. Um, and maybe I can, stay in touch with you so you know what's coming down the pipe with what we're doing and maybe you have ideas that you can contribute yourself um we actually yeah i mentioned alberta program yukon program this may will be starting a maritimes program as well so we'll be sending youth out to the maritimes for a whole nother um community feel so um lots of exciting things happening here thanks everybody and I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the conference. It's been great so far.